Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's very good indeed to welcome you here um, to the latest Cells Lunchtime Seminar. And I'm delighted to introduce um, Sir Stephen Wall, um, who has been um, one of the most influential players on the European circuit in the various capacities in which he has occupied. Um, and he has recently published a book called The Reluctant European and the details are on the chat. Now, all his CV is available for you to see on the CELS website. And I think what would be a good use of time is instead of me introducing him and saying how lucky we are to have him and to benefit from what um, he has to say, to let him talk. And the plan is that he will um, talk for um, about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions. If you could ask your questions via the Q&A um, box on the um, Zoom call and we'll try and read as many of these questions as we can and we aim to be finished by about 10 to 2 so that um, you can go on to your next activities. So Stephen the floor is yours and thank you very much for joining us. No well thank you for inviting me and thank you to those who are uh, giving up their lunch hour to, uh, to uh, participate. Yeah the, I, I spent a lot of my career in the British Foreign Office uh, in and around the European Union and was Britain's ambassador for, for five years to the European Union. And I wanted to write a book which really set out not so much the details of the whole Brexit process itself, but how had we got there? What was it about our relationship that had made it not inevitable, but had certainly created some of the conditions in which it happened? And I say not inevitable because, um, well, Dominic Cummings, uh, uh, himself said this would not have happened, i.e. the Leave vote would not have happened had it not been for the immigration issue, that's one factor. Had Boris Johnson decided that his political career was better served by campaigning to remain, or had Jeremy Corbyn decided that his political career was better served by actively campaigning for remain, it might have been different. So it's not inevitable, but there are a number of, of, uh, of fa factors, and I called the first chapter in the book A Thousand Years of History, because uh, when in 1961 Harold Macmillan, uh, the then Prime Minister, uh, applied not so much to join but to explore whether the conditions were there for Britain uh, to join, Hugh Gateskill, the leader of the, of the Labour Party, uh, said in a, in a speech at the party conference, this would be joining the common market, as we called it, would be the end of a thousand years of, 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 of history. And most of his audience would have had a feeling about what that meant, well, not, not necessarily an accurate feeling, because of course, you know, we are a country, like all countries of, of, uh, of uh, immigrants, my own forebears on my father's side were, came over with the Norman conquest and all that. Um, uh, and of course, our history has been mixed up with that of our continental neighbors uh, for, uh, forever. Nonetheless, I think there are certain defining things, one of which is geography. I mean, the fact that we are an island, uh, is different. I mean, it is different, uh, obviously, than having a land frontier. I think your horizons are different. You get into a sailing boat uh, uh, on the south coast and you can sail to Calais or you can sail to China. Uh, you do see the world uh, uh, differently. And that's certainly been uh, a, a, uh, a, a factor. And I think if there are uh, defining uh, moments in, in our earlier history, one of those defining moments is the Reformation, uh, which is, is even more, it seems to me, a, a political act, a political act of establishing separate English identity, English identity not under the control of a foreign power, uh, in this case, in particular, uh, the Pope, but not just the Pope. And that, that identity politics really seems to me to be a big feature uh, for quite a long for quite a long time after all uh, in uh, uh, the revolution of 1688 uh, we got rid of uh, the legitimate king James II and brought in uh, a foreigner uh, William of Orange because we wanted a Protestant king rather than uh, a Catholic king um, I mean this is very anecdotal but it's illustrative in 1931 my father who was not a Catholic got engaged to my mother who was a Catholic and his uh, aunt in, uh, in those days, if you, a non-Catholic married a Catholic, the Catholic church insisted uh, that the children be brought up as Catholics. And my father's aunt wrote to him from Derbyshire where he came from saying, do not forget that in the churchyard in Darleydale are the remains of generations of the Wall family, yeoman stock, the breath and backbone of England and do not allow your children to be put under the yoke of popery. 
But this is 1931, not 1531. And she's not talking about transubstantiation or whatever. She's talking about, about identity uh, and, not, and, and the, the power of uh, resisting the power of, of, of foreigners. And that sense of our identity, of course, was massively reinforced by the outcome of World War, War II. Whereas uh, our continental neighbors had either had their democracy laid low, uh, or in the case of Germany and Italy, uh, disgraced, ours was kind of validated and uh, vindicated. Uh, and we felt we had a place in the world, which was based around empire, although the end of empire was, uh, of course, imminent, and about our uniquely close relationship uh, with the United States. So Winston Churchill's great speech a year after the war in Zurich, in which he said that the future peace of Europe had to be based on combined Franco-German leadership of the continent was an extraordinary revolutionary idea then. These are after all two countries that have been to war with each other three times in less uh, than a century. But it's, I mean, there's been you know, there's a ridiculous argument. What would Churchill's view have been about Brexit? I mean, Churchill's view in that speech is very clear. He basically says, we want this to happen and we and the Commonwealth and the United States and hopefully Russia will give it our benign blessing, but we won't be, we won't be part of it. And that was the instinctive reaction, not just of him, but of the then Labour government, whose foreign secretary, uh, Ernie Bevin, was not uh, a kind of little Englander. Uh, Bevin was the, one of the principal authors of the creation of, of NATO and had a very strong sense of the need for unity in terms of defense of, of, uh, of, uh, of Western interests. But for, the, but for the British, politically and economically, uh, Europe was not significant. What was significant in trade terms, as well as politically, was the empire and the Commonwealth. And as late as 1955, Britain's largest export market was Australia, not, not any country of, the Europe, of Europe, elsewhere in Europe, not the United States, but Australia, then a country of only 10 million, uh, 10 million people. And officials and, and so on who were involved uh, when, first of all, the European Coal and Steel Community came in in 1951, and then the negotiations uh, began at Messina, 56, leading to the Treaty of Rome uh, in 57. Um, a journalist called Michael Charlton interviewed uh, lots of the people who'd been around during that period in later years, in the 1980s, and published a, a book called The Price of Victory. And almost all of them said, we simply did, it simply did not register with us that what was going on on the continent was uh, going to be significant uh, and, uh, uh, and important. The other thing that happened, I think, was that Britain put too much emphasis on its relationship with the uh, United States. The Suez debacle of 56 uh, was a shot across our bows in the sense that the mission failed partly because the Americans pulled the plug uh, uh, on the pound. But more significantly, I think what we failed to uh, appreciate in Britain was that once it became clear that the next war was not going to be started by Germany, but if it was going to happen, it would be started by the Soviet Union, then the front line of Western defense became the German frontier because it was across the West German frontier that Russian tanks would roll. And Russia's aggressive intent was very clear by their efforts to uh, basically uh, isolate and, and uh, bring Berlin under their control. And of course, what they had done in bringing under their control the rest of East Germany and much of Central uh, and Eastern Europe. So for the United States, uh, the front line of their defense became the German frontier, and therefore they had a really strong interest in seeing a strong, uh, wealthy West Germany uh, um, rise up after, after the war. And therefore they, they were prepared to make some economic sacrifice of their trade interests by encouraging uh, the common market, the European community, uh, which after all is based on uh, protectionist uh, principles. And British leaders at the time uh, failed to uh, uh, fail to see that. And it was only really when the economics began to change, i.e. that the, the prosperity of the new community of six was outstripping our own prosperity, that was combined with the realization, certainly on Macmillan's part, uh, that we, were, we, we had no, could no longer have any pretensions to be uh, a superpower. Macmillan wrote a pamphlet when we started negotiating with the EEC, which, he sent, which was sent around to uh, households uh, in Britain that made the point that there were only two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, with China coming up uh, fast uh, as well. 
well, and that for Britain to have influence with the world, it had to combine with like-minded countries. So that and the economics were the rationale behind the decision to open negotiations. And those negotiations proceeded and looked, although there were difficulties by the end of 1962, as if they would succeed when in January 63, President de Gaulle of France vetoed uh, the application. All kinds of reasons why that was done. Um, the then French agriculture minister said to Christopher Soames, his British opposite number, about a week before the veto, of course the gold isn't get, going to let you in. Um, uh, one dunghill with one cockerel, what's to, is what's to like? One, cock, one dunghill with two cockerels, as it would be if you come in, that's not so good. And that was certainly a factor. More importantly, I mean, the, although de Gaulle was no lover of the European institutions, the European Commission and, and, uh, and so on, this was, this new organization was the vehicle for Franco-German reconciliation uh, and a vehicle through which France could clasp Germany of whom and the French were still afraid to its bosom and in a sense exercise a, a degree of control over Germany as well as leadership uh, of Europe as a whole. And the structure uh, of European community policy was based around agriculture. 90% of the initial budget went on the so-called common agricultural policy, which massively suited uh, France's economic uh, interests. And of course, de Gaulle drew his support from that uh, sector of, uh, of French uh, society. What de Gaulle also saw uh, very far-sightedly was that Britain would, would actually transform the nature of the organization because we were outward looking. We were not protectionist. We wanted uh, a free trade. And that if Britain joined, uh, Ireland, uh, 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 Denmark, Norway, it was foreseen, um, would, uh, would come in with us. But he, beyond that, he foresaw that the European community would in, increase in numbers over time, he thought to maybe 50 or, or, 18, uh, or 18 members. So uh, the, the veto took place. The Conservatives lost office in 19, uh, in 1964. Labour came in, having been hostile uh, to the Tory negotiations, but Harold Wilson came to the same conclusions that Macmillan had come to. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, an attempt by the British government to join was vetoed by uh, de Gaulle a second time in 1967. When Labour lost office in 1970, they were about to embark on negotiations and those negotiations fell instead to the Conservative government of, of uh, Edward Heath with Labour opposing. Uh, so Labour opposed the terms of, of membership and the only way that Wilson could keep his party from turning into an anti-European party was by promising to renegotiate the terms if Labour was uh, re-elected and put them to the people. So when Labour came back in 74, they renegotiated and we had the first referendum, a referendum that was won by a 66% vote in favour of staying for reasons connected, I think, with a number of things. First of all, the European community was seen correctly by people in Britain to be a success story as compared with the British economy. And one feature of the whole of this, of this story, I think, up until the time of Margaret Thatcher, is that of a British economy in decline, really, compared with that of our European uh, partners. The vast majority of the British press was solidly in favor uh, of membership. Uh, there was respect for uh, certain politicians. Uh, I mean, the, the, the leaders of the, of the Yes campaign were on the whole respected politicians. The leaders of the No campaign were not, and that resonated with people in a way that probably uh, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't today. But the referendum didn't, didn't settle the divisions uh, within the Labour Party and didn't actually achieve it very much in substantive terms. And in particular, because we joined late, uh, Heath had had to accept disadvantageous terms, particularly as regards the budget into which Britain, uh, in per capita terms, one of the poorer member states, was the only net contributor along with, with Germany. And the Labour government, uh, Callaghan, uh, the Prime Minister in 79, had signalled that this was going to be a big issue for renegotiation. And when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister, she took this on uh, with a vengeance and effectively uh, spent uh, the first, almost the first five years of her term as Prime Minister, uh, renegotiating the financial terms of membership. So we, uh, we joined, um, instead of joining six years after the Treaty of Rome, we only joined 16 years after the Treaty of Rome uh, and effectively uh, spent 10 years in renegotiating uh, the terms of our membership. And part of the terms of that membership were a commitment formally made, publicly made by Heath, just before we joined, to economic and political uh, union. 
And yet this was something which the British political establishment and to an extent public opinion found hard to swallow because our sense of national identity very much rooted in the sovereignty of, of, uh, uh, of parliament. Divisions within both parties, including even then in the, uh, in the Conservative Party. So although the British government had signed up to these uh, commitments, it actually hoped for something different. It hoped really for a union that would be governed by the large by the th three biggest member states, uh, Britain, France, and, uh, 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 and Germany. But in practice, we found that difficult to do for two main reasons. One, the relationship between France and Germany was very uh, well established, and they had a very a much clearer motivation for making a success of that bilateral relationship, and that that relationship was more important to them than the relationship of either uh, with the United Kingdom. And we did, you know, we, we did from the inside, we did try and in some respects uh, succeeded in changing uh, the nature of the organization in ways in which the French certainly uh, didn't like. And the Helmut Schmidt, the, the German chancellor at the, at the time, who, although of a different party from Margaret Thatcher, liked her and admired her, and she liked and admired him in a way that she didn't with his conservative successor, Cole. Schmidt, uh, in very, about a year after Thatcher came to power in 79, had a private conversation with the British ambassador in Bonn and said, what are you guys playing at? We all hoped that when you joined, you would make a significant difference. You'd bring something that we didn't have. Yet, what have you done? You're behaving like Italian shopkeepers, he said. Uh, I hope there are, if there are any Italians in the audience, they will aim off for, for uh, Schmidt's view. You're not, you're, you're, all you're doing is doing something negative. And okay, you're paying too much in the budget. It needs to be settled, but it's minuscule. And you're preoccupied by these petty issues and you can't see the, British, British, uh, the bigger picture and you're not doing anything to uh, um, uh, provide leadership. And so there were uh, opportunities uh, missed. Jim Callaghan, while he'd still been uh, prime minister, had been the first person approached by Helmut Schmidt when he proposed for the exchange rate mechanism, which was the precursor of the single currency. Uh, he then approached President Giscard d'Estaing of France, who signed up uh, for political reasons, more for economic, and Callaghan couldn't do it, understandably. Economically, it was very difficult for Britain at the time. We were in the appalling uh, economic situation, and politically within the Labour Party, he was fighting a battle within the Labour Party against uh, the uh, anti-European, so he didn't have the, he didn't have the strength uh, uh, to do it. So it was uh, an opportunity missed. And when later on uh, new treaty changes were proposed, because of all our difficulties over the sovereignty issue and the, so the perception of ceding sovereignty, um, that too was a real problem. The paradox is that the biggest single change made uh, since the Treaty of Rome was the Single European Act of 1986, uh, signed by Margaret Thatcher, uh, in which there was a big transfer of uh, articles of the treaty from unanimity to majority voting in order to complete the single, uh, the single market. And I, I, would, I would say that there are kind of three big achievements really of the European Union. One is, the, the, one is that, the second is enlargement, and the third obviously is the single, uh, the single currency. And two out of those three are ones where Britain was in a, a leading role. Uh, Margaret, the, the single market is there on the, uh, the, the face of the Treaty of Rome. It's on page one of the treaty, but very little had been done. Uh, apart from uh, one or two findings by the European Court for 30 years until Margaret Thatcher really put this on the agenda. It suited her to do so because it reflected the kind of liberalization of economic policy that she wanted. But nonetheless, she was prepared to uh, make the, the big switch in terms of accepting uh, that there would be more majority voting. And even after she became a convinced uh, skeptic in her older age, she never, she never denounced uh, what, she had, uh, what she had done. Similarly, on enlargement, uh, if you, if you, when I was working for Tony Blair, uh, he asked me to show him a copy of the Bruges speech made by Margaret Thatcher in 1988, and regarded as, uh, at the time, as, by our partners as an outrageous denunciation of everything that they held dear. And Tony Blair said to me, well, after you read the speech, this is rather a good speech, he said, and if you read it, uh, I mean, it's a reflection on quite a lot of things that if you read that speech today, it looks like a commonplace. The first thing she said was, you know, we've not rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain to have them reimposed from a centralizing Brussels authority. And secondly, she said, and remember, we're talking about countries that were then 
behind the Iron Curtain, let us not forget that Warsaw, Prague and Budapest are great European cities. And even that was regarded uh, like spitting in church. And there was a deep suspicion that the only reason the British were motivated to propose enlargement was because we wanted to dilute the whole project. And in fact, if you look at the documents, that's not the case. The motivation, I mean, starting with Greece, after the fall of the colonels, progressing through Spain and Portugal after fascism, and then to the countries of Eastern and Central Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the main motivation of the British government was to promote democratic values. Now, it's a fact is, as well, they hoped that a larger organization would dilute some of the uh, intensity of the desire for political and economic union uh, of, uh, of our partners, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the main uh, motivation. And then, of course, the third big issue where we, which we didn't take the lead and indeed absented ourselves, was the single uh, currency. I was working for John Major at the time, and I think it's now forgotten that as, that as big a preoccupation as opting out was ensuring that we had the right to opt in. A uh, generation, really, of civil servants and, and politicians had been scarred uh, by the fact that we'd had to accept bad terms, if you like, for joining the European community because we joined late. And, and there was a determination to ensure that if at one, some point we did want to join the single currency, we wouldn't uh, face any, uh, any obstacles. But I, I, mean, I didn't myself see at the time just how significant our non-participation was because I think basically we absented ourselves from something that became self-evidently the sort of core existential policy really uh, of the European uh, Union and I think we then became on a divergent path uh, which made it uh, easier if you like um, to get to the point where we got to uh, in uh, in 2016. And I think that if you look at the negotiation that David Cameron conducted as, as Prime Minister, um, had he won the referendum and the various concessions that he secured come into, come into place, uh, you, you're left wondering almost what would have been left of British uh, membership. You know, when you spend a lot of time negotiating away from the, the opening lines of the Treaty of Rome, ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, you can't, can't even sign up to that. And it was always ever close union of the peoples, uh, not governments. You've gone uh, a, a very, a very long way. Um, I think we you know we now we now have to look to our future and assuming the assumption that we get an agreement with uh, our former partners. On what basis can we rebuild uh, a positive uh, relationship? How do we use uh, such strengths as as uh, as we have and we do have? Um, to establish a collaboration, which won't happen automatically. I don't think geographical proximity makes it happen automatically. It has to be worked on. There has to be the will to do it. Even within the European Union, I was very struck. This is my last thing before I shut up. Um, we had bilateral summits each year with the French president, with the German chancellor. And having those summits made us sit down on both sides of, of, of the channel, particularly in the case of the French, and think, what are we going to do to make this a success? What initiatives can we, can we take? And so quite a lot of the positive impetus came from that. That's no longer there. I mean, you know, the, the, the phone lines now between uh, Brussels, between Brussels and other European capitals and London uh, will by and large be silent. For 90% of the business of the European Union, they will have no particular motivation for, for wanting to, the, the British view. So as one of my French friends uh, uh, emailed me recently, um, you, the British, will have to make yourselves wanted again uh, if, that, uh, if that relationship is to be rebuilt. Anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you.